Hi, it's Reverend Sue Lin. I'm here at the St Peter's Library that you can see behind me to bring you this week's um, online worship. Uh, this is the 30th of January 2022. Um, we're, we're having quite a different in-person service this week. It's the fifth Sunday of the month, so we're allowed to do something different. Uh, so we're having a service uh, in the church 9.30 that's a little bit more like the Saturday evening service that we used to have. We haven't had a service like that since uh, before the beginning of COVID. Um, so what I'm doing today is, is a little bit different and I am going to deliver you a sermon of sorts. Um, the sermon reflection that I've written for that service isn't like your standard sermon and I've just um, adapted it slightly for online. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that will be something that speaks to you. Uh, but for our liturgy today, I'm going to be using the Iona Community Worship Book and we're going to be using the Morning Service Liturgy. So, let's do it now. The world belongs to God, the earth and all its people. How good and how lovely it is to live together in unity Love and faith come together. Justice and peace join hands. If the Lord's disciples keep silent, the stones would shout aloud. Open our lips, O God, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. And we're not having a, a hymn, but I will read you the words of um, one of the hymns that's recommended for the morning Iona service. And I'll read it to you as a poem. Morning opens wide before us, like a door into the light. Just beyond, the day lies waiting, ready to throw off the night and we stand upon its threshold, poised to turn and take its flight. Now the earth in all its glory springs to meet the rising sun, warms to all who walk upon it, cradling all that will be done, all our labour, all our loving, mingle and become as one. We receive God's graceful moment while the day is fresh and still, ours to choose how we will greet it, ours to make it what we will. Here is given perfect freedom, every hope in love to fulfil. As we take the first step together, passing through the door of the day, may the love of Christ, the Creator, give us peace in all we say. Heart for all that lies before us, grace to guide us on our way. And now we have a prayer of confession. Holy God, maker of all, have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, servant of the poor, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, breath of life, have mercy on us. So in a moment of silence, let's remember our own faults and failings. I confess to God and in the company of all God's people that my life and the life of the world are broken by my sin. May God forgive me, Christ renew me, and the Spirit enable me to grow in love. And you confess to God in the company of all God's people that your lives and the life of the world are broken by your sin. May God forgive you. Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. So we turn again, God, and give us life, that your people may rejoice in you. Make me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Give us again the joy of your help. With your spirit of freedom, sustain us. And now, as Jesus taught us, we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The psalm for this week, the appointed psalm for this week is Psalm 38. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down on me because of your wrath there is no health in my body. There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. All my longings lie before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pounds, my strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbours stay far away. Those who want to kill me set their traps. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they scheme and lie. I am like the deaf who cannot hear, like the mute who cannot speak. I have become like the one who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. Lord, I wait for you. You will answer, my Lord, for I said, Do not let them gloat or exalt themselves over me when my feet slip. For I am about to fall, and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. Many have become my enemies without cause. Those who hate me without reason are numerous. Those who repay my good with evil lodge accusations against me, though I seek only to do what is good. Lord, Do not forsake me. Do not be far from me, my God. Come quickly and help me, my Lord and Saviour. Here ends the psalm. The Old Testament reading this week is um, Jonah chapter 2. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From, the deep, from deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again on your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited vomited Jonah onto dry land. Here ends the Old Testament reading. The New Testament reading is taken from parts of... John chapter 11. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death, 
No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Here ends the reading. So I just want to reflect a little bit on those readings. Like I said, it's not, not exactly planned as a sermon, but it's, it is a reflection. Um, and I'd invite you to reflect with me. So may the words of my mouth and the reflections and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, it always happens in the darkness. COVID has gone on for <laughs> so long. <laughs> oh, back in March uh, 2020, when they first said the churches had to close until May, we were like, until May? Oh no, what a terrible long time. And here we are now in 2022, eh? Church hasn't been closed the whole time, but, you know, it's been uncertain. Um, all sorts of closures and regulations and everything else. Um, and we've had this whole series of only until's. It's only until May 2020. It's only until this thing dies back a bit. It's only until everybody's double vaccinated. It's only until. To the point that we've, we've given up planning because so often we've made plans that have had to be set aside and we haven't been able to follow through. And it's been disheartening. And we've been depressed and we've been despondent. Um, and we still are, most of us, some of us. It's still a struggle. So the theme for the service that we're having on Sunday is turning points. So I wonder where is our COVID turning point? When will things improve? We have so many questions that have no answer or no answer that we know of. God knows, but we do not. So the readings I have given to you, chosen for you today, the psalm was the appointed psalm, but the others were um, of my own choice. Uh, now we've recently mentioned Jonah, I've recently mentioned Jonah while I've been preaching, um, and how um, this chapter, chapter two, is the center of the chiastic structure of Jonah. So a chiastic structure is when the beginning mirrors the end, and the bit after the beginning mirrors the bit before the end, and etc etc and then there's this central point which is often a turning point or, or there's some important point that's made in the middle of a chiastic structure um, so if we recap what's going on with Jonah there he is at the beginning of chapter two he's in the belly of the fish 
Um, and he doesn't know where this fish is, apart from that it's obviously it's in the water, but he doesn't know where it is. Um, but Jonah himself is still descending, whether the fish is going down to the bottom of the sea or it's just Jonah in his spirit. This little poetic section shows him descending and going down and down in his spirit. So he's sunk and right at the centre of the poem. Um, he can't go any lower. He's right at the bottom. Where is it now? Um, he's down to the roots of the mountain. I sank down. The earth beneath barred me forever. So that's where Jonah is at that, that central point. Um, and yet, when he can go no lower, he starts shouting <laughs> with praise to God and he begins to ascend again until eventually the fish finds its way to shore and vomits him out. I don't like you, Jonah. And he spits him out on the, onto the shore. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I referred to this. Um, and for a moment, I wondered if we'd found a chiastic. It was that week when I wondered if we'd find a chiastic structure in the middle of John. Um, and then I had to tell you, no, it was disappointing. There wasn't one there at all. If you remember, we were talking about when water was turned into wine. Um, and there was a wedding and it was on the third day. So the question was, is that third, the wedding, the fact that we the wedding at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in John's gospel happened on the third day, was there any meaning to that relating to Jesus' resurrection on the third day? We worked out that that wasn't relevant to John's gospel, so it wasn't. But if it had been a chiastic structure, I posited that there would be a turning point in the middle. And actually, we found that there was an important point in the middle of John's Gospel. Chapter 11, bang in the middle, was the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. So in a way, there was a turning point before the death of Lazarus. Jesus was going about his ministry, but that marked the beginning of the end where the, the plot began to kill Jesus. So that's why I've chosen that reading, because in a way, that is a turning point in the centre of John's Gospel, where the, the whole direction changes. Um, so there we go so um, we have in the centre the death and the resurrection of Lazarus so it's as low as you can go like, like Jonah he reached the deepest point you can he was dead <laughs> but even then there was a, a rising again a resurrection so these two readings have got something in common the turning point happened in the darkness for Jonah it was in the belly of the fish he was there for three days for Lazarus, it was in the darkness of the tomb, which had been sealed with a stone, and he was there for four days. Both were beyond hope. Both couldn't see, they were in complete darkness, they had no knowledge of, of anything. And yet for both, the darkness contained the turning point. And they didn't see it coming because it happened in the dark. Now, um, if we're having the... If you, were, or if you are at the in-person service, you'll know that we're having a little time of reflection there. So if you did want to pause me to reflect on those points, then you can. But let's move on to the second part of this week's reflection. Things don't instantly get better after the turning point, and they can get worse. So if things instantly and clearly improved dramatically uh, when we reached a turning point, we'd know that we got there, we'd know that the darkest hour is over and we're heading into the dawn. Um, but often we don't realise that we've turned the corner straight away. In Jonah verses 5 to 6 it says this, I, I refer to it just now. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed wrapped around my head, to the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever so he was still in the dark inside the fish he was there still and yet this forever is the beginning of an upturn praise came back as he remembered his god thanksgiving happened in the darkness and the fish took him up and he spat him out onto the shore but even so, it wasn't all good from Jonah, even from that point on. He still had to go to Nineveh, which he didn't want to do in the first place. He still had to proclaim calamity to them. And he didn't want to do that either. And he didn't like the fact that God relented and saved the Ninevites. He wasn't happy about that either. And likewise, Lazarus' turning point didn't mean an instant happy ending either. He was alive, 
but I expect he had some healing to do. Must be quite a lot. I mean, if you're getting over something like COVID, you've got to get over death. It must be quite hard. It must, it must have taken him a little while. Um, but anyway, he, he died of natural causes the first time it tells us in scripture that he was sick. But now the chief priests were out to kill him. They wanted him dead again. And uh, but this was because he, um, that people were the witnesses of, the re of his resurrection. All of that was increasing Jesus' popularity, which they weren't very keen on. And they were also out. This is when the plot to kill Jesus really began in force, um, simply because of this, the raising of Lazarus and other signs that Jesus was performing. And they were worried that Israel, the, the Jewish nation, was at threat because of it. And from that time, it says in verse 54, Jesus could no longer appear in public. So even this turning point had happened. It wasn't all good news. Things were not instantly easy again. Now another, I was looking at my Bible, rather my Bible kind of looked at me this morning. <laughs> I wanted to go, <laughs> confession time, I wanted to go and play a game on my phone, but I saw the Bible and the Bible was kind of winking at me, saying, you need to open me now. You haven't looked at me yet this morning. It was only about six o'clock, so... It wasn't so late, but I, I picked up my Bible. I opened it up, and um, there was a verse. I said, right, Lord, if I'm going to pick this up rather than play my game today, which is what I felt like doing, um, then I want it to speak to me. So I opened it up, and it happened to be on a particular verse, and I prayed about it and said, right, okay, Lord, then what is it you're saying to me? And I figure maybe it was something, something like this, um, that this too was another turning point. It was Matthew 26. I better let you know what it was I read which I'm sure I've marked, yeah. Um, so it was this. Um, then he, Jesus, turned, returned to the disciples, this is in Gethsemane, by the way, um, and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? I wasn't, <laughs> just woke up. Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. So that was what I'd read. Um, and it, this was the turning point, um, in Jesus' ministry, um, where he was just about to be arrested. So it was between that um, active ministry again and the passivity that happened um, and lead, led to the crucifixion. So the disciples are sleeping and resting, but they're not going to be doing that much more or any more for, for some time. And it interested me that Jesus said, come on, wake up, get up, let's go. My betrayer is coming. They were walking into that situation together. Things were about to get very difficult for them all. So again, if we're in the service, we're gonna have a period of reflection now, but we'll skip that. And if you want one, pause me and have it by yourself. So now I wanna move on to the third part of the reflection. And this is called trusting God to make that turning point happen. Trusting God to make that turning point happen appeal to God Jesus is at the center there's something elusive and frustrating about a turning point um, there's little that we can do to make it happen and sometimes we don't even see it when it does as I talked about at the beginning thinking about COVID again how helpless are we we can be vaccinated, we can obey the restrictions, we can be diligent in mask wearing, can't we? And uh, keep our chins warm in the cold weather. But we have to trust God that things will turn around, that there will be a turning point, that things will get better. Now, remember back to that psalm, Psalm 38, that I read you just now. It's a psalm of David. Now, whether David was writing of himself or a fictional someone, it, it's got overtones of Job about it, I think. But whatever, whoever David was writing about, he portrays a man with ill health in great despair. Now, one commentator said here that this is a man in the psalm. This is a man who's in need of a physician. He needs a doctor or more likely he needs a psychiatrist. But what can this guy do? He makes three different appeals to God. That's what he does. And this, it says at the beginning, Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. He's appealing to God. Later on, he says, all my longings are open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart 
pounds, my strength is gone in me. Even the light in my eyes are gone. And then at the end, he says, Lord, do not forsake me. Do not be far from me, my God. Come quickly and help me, my Lord and my Saviour. So the beginning, the middle and the end, he appeals to God. Who else is there that can intervene? Likewise, Jonah, he threw himself onto God at the beginning of this passage that we just read to you. He says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the deep of realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. And in the middle, he says, but you, Lord, my God, you brought my life up from the pit. That's the turning point. You brought my life up from the pit. And at the end, it says, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And that's when the Lord made the fish up on the shore there. So again, it's the beginning, the middle, and the end. And Lazarus? Jesus. Jesus was in it from the start. Jesus was there. Jesus was the one who made the turning point happen. He knew from the beginning what God was about to bring, what God was bringing about, and why. Go back to that reading. I'm all over the place today, see? Yeah, so he said in verse 4, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus was there at the turning point. Jesus made that turning point happen. He said, Lazarus, come out. And Jesus was there with him afterwards as people came out to see him and Lazarus. He was there with Lazarus as that plot to kill each of them hotted up. Jesus is at the centre. We appeal to God in the darkness for a turning point. And again, this is where we would do something reflective in this service together. So there we go. I've brought you my thinking about those things, about how, how let, me, let me give you those headings again, about how the turning point happens in the darkness and consequently we don't always see it when it's happened. That things don't instantly get better after that turning point. In fact, they can even get worse. And thirdly, we looked at trusting God to make that turning point happen. Give our appeals to God, knowing Jesus is at the centre. So I think it would be really good to end in prayer, actually. So let's do that now. Let's pray. Father God, we raise all of these thoughts and this thinking to you this morning behind all of this in the back of my mind at least has been the place that we are at with covid at the moment lord maybe the turning point has already happened maybe that point of the lowest and deepest descent to the roots of the mountains has happened and maybe you are bringing our lives up from the pit or maybe there's more to come and we're not there yet lord we don't know But we trust you, we appeal to you, Lord, and we trust you with our prayer that you bring about that turning point if you haven't already and you journey with us as we ascend back up and you vomit us on our shore, the shore of a new beginning. So, Lord, we place all of this, all of our despair, all of the darkness before you, knowing that even the dark darkness isn't dark to you and that you are the light of the world. Amen. So let's continue with our service. So, Lord, we bring to you now our intercessionary prayers. And we ask that you journey with us as your church, not only in this place, in Comox, on Church Street, but with all of your churches in this valley, in this nation, and across the world. Lord, make us a holy people. Make us a people who are pleasing in your sight. Make us a people who are willing to be light and salt in the world. Help us to seek direction in the, in the days of darkness. Um, help us to uh, be the first signs of the morning, the first signs of the light. 
Help us too to be honest, actually, about where we are. If we are feeling down or depressed or burdened with darkness, Lord. We bring that to you in an honest way, knowing that you can enter that place with us and guide us through. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we bring to you uh, the leaders of the world, not only of your church, but everybody who has a government over others. Pray for the, uh, the problems that are happening in Burkina Faso at the moment. We pray for protection in that place. We pray for the leaders of all nations who must be weary and tired as COVID continues to ravage the whole world. Lord, we pray that as they deliberate what to do, that your values are in their minds and in their hearts. And that they govern not out of self, selfish interest, but in the, light, in, in the way that somebody governs who as the heart of the people, as their main priority. Lord, we know there are many places across the world where government is not like that. So Lord, we pray that those people who live there have a sense of hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, I raise to you those members of our church family at the moment who are struggling. We have so many that are either unwell themselves or have family that they're extremely worried about right now. COVID of course is part of that Lord but there's more. I'm just thinking of that story of Lazarus there where Jesus promised that his illness would not end in death as indeed it didn't. And we pray into those situations where people are ill and afraid of dying but yet, Lord, that is not your plan for them. We pray too for those whose journey will take them there, who are on that final road. We pray that they have peace and support and that you help us as church know how to come alongside those people. Who, who needs our input? Who needs space? Who needs prayer? Who needs company. Help us have the wisdom to know when it's right to go and visit people when we need to protect them because of exposures to COVID and if we can't go and see them Lord just let them feel that, that uh, their church family are praying for them and with them and that your light is shining on them. Lord in your mercy hear our prayer. O oh God, lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. We ask it for your own name's sake. Amen. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour. Jesus Christ. Amen. And just some closing responses before the blessing. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We will not offer to God offerings that cost us nothing. Go in peace to serve the Lord. We will seek peace and pursue it. In the name of the Trinity of love, one God in perfect community. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you and those that you love now and always. Amen. So there we are. That's the end of our service for the 30th of January. Next week again, it's going to be a little bit different because the offices are closed. We've all the paid and lay staff have got the week off. 
and next Sunday service is going to be lay led. Hooray for me, I don't have to lead the worship. I can actually be a part of the congregation. I'm gonna really look forward to that. Um, but I will be recording something online for you, some pre-recorded something online for you, so you've got something. Um, and also I'm gonna be experimenting a little bit with the possibility of filming the service, live streaming the service. Um, we've not, well, we have kind of done that before, but I'm, having, I'm gonna have a little experiment to see if we can do that. So look out for us on Facebook and or YouTube. I haven't decided which one I'm gonna try yet. Um, you might be able to join us live as well on at 9.30 on Sunday the 6th of February. So there we go. Um, it's been lovely worshipping with you and we'll see you again. You'll see me here um, next week or two weeks after that we'll be back to normal. God bless you all. Bye bye for now.